I, I just I, I don't normally open up the show just doing a, a, a slight public service announcement, but this is a really important one. Town Square Media, which is the the parent company of our four radio stations here in this building in in Twin Falls, Idaho, and we also have a cluster of stations in Boise, some stations in Yakima, uh, some in the Tri Cities area of Washington, Colorado Springs, Wyoming, Montana. Uh, we have a number of stations, but in each one of our cities, we are doing a promotion as we head toward the Christmas holiday called Town Square Cares. I, I bring that up today because I think it's important. We've got about two weeks before we start nominating military families. What we're doing is we're actually soliciting donations from people in the community. And then what we're going to do in a couple of weeks, we're going to solicit names of, of military families in the community. And one of those families will be the recipient of a Christmas package from Town Square Media in each and every one of our cities where we do business. I was just looking at our website and newsradio1310.com, of course, and if I can't find it on there, there's <laughs> it's supposed to be an easy-to-find link where you can click on and get details how you can contribute because we have a lot of people. These families are very stressed because people have gone through so many deployments, many of them for 10 or 15 years now, and it, it, it's just a, you know it, it's a way to say thank you to someone for what they've done for all the rest of us. If you can't find it right away, it'll be back up there soon. But if you can't find it at our website, I would just remind you, you could find it, for instance, at the Cool website or at KEZJ's website. And we really would like you to go there. And if you feel that you can contribute something, make a contribution. And then, as I said, in a couple of weeks, we're going to start taking nominations for for the names of some families in this community who could be the recipients of that uh, of that project and really make the, a much brighter Christmas for all of them. And, and let them know that we do care, not just Town Square Media, but that the entire community cares. Nine minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Colley with you. Thank you for joining me this morning. Temperature says 35. It doesn't feel it. Uh, I was outside a few minutes ago. Luckily, the wind's not blowing, but it is a it is a chilly morning, a chilly start to the day, and things aren't really going to turn around anytime soon. The next few mornings, it might be even colder when we do all of this. Not that anyone out there is, you know, it, it's Idaho after all. Anything they throw at you, you can deal with it. We've got a guest coming up, actually a couple of guests coming up that will be in studio, likely also a third guest by telephone in the 9 o'clock hour. And it will take as long as we need to do. It might be for half an hour. It might be for 40 minutes. But they're coming by. We're talking about the changes that are going to happen in testing in Idaho schools. Now, I keep saying common core, but really I think that the the testing is is bigger than that. And Idaho, uh, the education department is reconsidering some of these things at least the approach, and, and we don't really, I don't think we have a, an answer yet as to where we're going to go with all of this, but there is some concern that perhaps we need to retool this or tweak this or perhaps go to some other type of testing system. So we're going to be joined in studio by State Representative Lance Clow. He actually has some experience serving on a committee in Boise where they discuss these issues. Also, Secondary Programs Director from Twin Falls School District, L.T. Erickson, who's got a really cool name. You should point this out uh, if you see him on the street someday. Uh, LT, of course, a couple of famous football players with those initials. And then he's got the name Erickson, which was a name of a fame. Uh, well, I guess if you're a Seahawks fan, you'd say an infamous coach, but uh, a coach nonetheless who had some success in some parts of the world. Uh, they're coming by in studio, and then we're likely going to have someone as well from the education department chiming in from Boise by telephone this morning. And the goal is really, this is a public service to explain to all of you in the next hour. What's going to happen if you have kids in school, exactly what you can expect when we get to perhaps next year and beyond. And some of these things have been obviously, uh, the word I think you use is moratorium for the time being. There's there's, there's there's a hold on some of these tests. It's 8-11 and thank you for joining me this morning. And I do want to open up with a couple of other things before we move along. And Keith Thompson, I believe, is joining us from Idaho State Police at 8.30 and he'll have an update on some of the things going on uh, inside Idaho State Police and maybe some public safety warnings as well. But in the meantime, in my my search, my vast search every day to bring you details on stories that apply to us too as well here in Idaho, I scour the planet. I, well, in this day and age with the internet, that means I can do it from home. I just sit down, pour myself a glass of apple cider, and I sit down at the computer for a couple of hours. So when I say I scour the planet, it, it I know it makes me sound like I'm really working hard and dripping in sweat and, and you know, just just at the end of the day, just exhausted from this. But no, I'd be looking at the computer anyway, I suppose. On the other hand, I have a lot of sources that I check, and I've been building these over the years. I've been doing talk radio 
since 1994, 95, back in that range. And I've been doing it on a full-time basis pretty much for most of the last dozen years. And over time, I learned that there were a lot of great sources I could use for the program. One of those is a, is a blog that comes out of North Dakota. It's considered one of the 100 best political blogs every year in America. It gets that designation. It gets on the list. It's written by a guy named Rob Port. Rob Port used to be a, a radio guy like me. And now he exclusively runs this blog. It's his, it's his means of making a living. And it's been very successful because he's still doing it after about uh, seven or eight years. And he covers some national topics, and he covers some topics in, uh, in the Dakotas and Minnesota as well, where he's got the base of his audience. But I've been a subscriber for a number of years to this. I found this yesterday because in, Mi in Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis, and in Fargo, North Dakota, they are seeing an influx of Syrian refugees. Sound familiar? And he's got some details about what's going on here. And Lutheran Social Services, which is also involved in many other parts of the country in this refugee resettlement effort, Lutheran Social Services decided to have a meeting where they would destroy some myths about these refugee resettlement programs and about refugees themselves. And he's discussing what happened there, but he's, he's raising some eyebrows because apparently he said they're not giving people the full truth. And he writes, Jessica Thomason, CEO of Lutheran Social Services of North Dakota, set out to bust some myths about refugee resettlement. She tried to address the claim that refugees add to crime in North Dakota by citing numbers released to immigration at the national level. And, and then there's some quotes here from her as she's speaking at a hotel in Fargo, North Dakota, trying to give everyone a rundown of what's going on. But Mr. Port, the writer of the blog, says, Thomason is talking about the impact of immigration both legal and illegal, on the nation. And he says, those aren't the same things. So she's trying to blur what's going on here, blur the numbers. Newspaper folks, though, they eat this up. They go running back and say, hey, there's a fellow traveler over there who works for a big organization and hangs out at all the right parties. So these are the facts, because she says so. Thomason also addressed the impact of refugees on government services by providing really no information at all. And then there's some more quotes from her here, but he says, all of the information about the national impact of immigration, none of the information is about the specific impact on refugee resettlement in North Dakota, he writes, and its local communities like Fargo, Grand Forks, and Bismarck. Does that sound familiar to anyone who has been dealing with the bureaucracy here on the local level? I mean, we had someone at one of these college of Southern Idaho trustee meetings get up and say that this program was great because his restaurant choices were better. You know, I don't want to say dumb as a box of rocks, but if that's what you use to base this on, your approval of the program is because somebody somewhere is preparing a meal for you that you haven't had before or that you wouldn't normally get. If that's your whole rationale for supporting this program, you're a dang fool. Meanwhile, there's more to this. He says, when local officials, now this is impressive, because local officials here don't ask many questions. I think that's been our experience. Well, if they have, they've done it quite quietly behind the scenes. I will admit they've probably done that. I'm not here to really give them a, a big hit with a cudgel today because, really, and, and I think I, I give them some slack because, as they've said, this is a top-down program, and they pretty much have to just accept it. But the writer says, when local officials would like Lutheran Social Services to give them more details about the specific local impacts of refugee resettlement, Lutheran Social Services doesn't show up for the meeting. No. <laughs> In other words, hey, here's what we want you to see. Uh, please don't bother to ask any more questions and don't look anywhere else. It surprises me, though, because from what I know about North Dakota, uh, they have, a, a and, and Minnesota, too, a neighboring state, most of the Democrats who now run there are cross-endorsed by something called the Farmer Labor Party which goes all the way back to the days of Norman Thomas in the 1920s, and farmer labor movement was a big socialist. It was run by American labor unions, and they were trying to create farming unions and agricultural unions, and, and they were voting for all of these, Robert La Follette and Norman Thomas and all of these people who were socialists, were really the driving force behind it. So Democrats who run, well, they run Minnesota, and they partially run North Dakota, well, they all have the designation after their names, DFL, for Democrat Farmer Labor. But even in those states, people are standing up and they're demanding to get some answers about refugee resettlement. Now, we're told that Idaho is the reddest state in the union. We heard that comment from a lawyer a couple of weeks ago on the show 
a uh, fellow out of Idaho Falls who was on the air with us. It's the reddest state in the union. At least the people are, if not the government. But if, if, the, if the farmer labor party and the socialists in Minnesota and the Dakotas can ask more questions, more prying questions about refugee resettlement programs, then why can't the Republicans who dominate governments in Idaho be doing the same thing? What the heck is going on here? <laughs> you know, and I don't mean to say it's an embarrassment or anything like that, but if you're a Republican, you know what the base thinks and you know what it believes, and you know the base isn't too happy right now about a lot of these things, and yet it's the people out there who are saying workers of the world unite who are actually asking more questions. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. Meanwhile, story today, a friend of mine emailed it my way. It's out of Michigan, a town called Hamtramck, Michigan. They have elected a mostly Islamic city council. And the, the questions uh, that were being asked by people online, that is in the comment sections, are very, very interesting. But he managed to catch one before the comments were pulled down. Some fellow wrote a list of comments, and he said, in Islam, and he said, there's going to be an informational meeting at CSI in a few weeks where you're going to have some Islamic professor come in and tell you it's a religion of peace. There's nothing to worry about. You people are just a bunch of knuckle-dragging Neanderthals. Go home. Go away, you bigot racist. Get out of our way. But according to what this writer has done his research, in the early Quran, when Muhammad was first getting his re revelation and his people were in the minority in Mecca, they talked about living well and living with their brothers of other f faiths and everyone was happy and they wanted to coexist. And then as his numbers grew, his revelations, they got changed. God started sending him different messages, apparently. And God said, well, now that there are more of you, perhaps you need to wage war against these people. And then when they became the dominant force on the Arabian Peninsula, then it became, we've got to get rid of these people if they don't believe. They're going to convert or they're going to die. All of these things changed, evolved in the course of the Quran. So when someone says, well, it's a religion of peace, they expect that you haven't actually read that book. I read it about 30 years ago. A friend of mine loaned me a copy, and I read it over a course of about a week. The thing is, when they tell you that, it was in the very beginning, but as the book goes on and there's an evolution in the strength of these people, more and more converts, and they're able to go out and actually sort of bully their neighbors, the faith changes. So here's something that you might want to do, and I know it's a lot of work. Maybe pick up a copy somewhere at your local library and read it. So when you go to one of these meetings and someone tells you that, you're prepared. You can qu quote whatever you need to do to point out that, that, that there have been some changes in that faith as it moved along through time. We've got more coming up. Hey, uh, well, just quickly, we'll get to the clock. I have a friend who runs a science museum just down the street from that guy's creation museum. Uh, needless to say, they don't like each other. It's 823. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Down to 33 now. We were at 35 when we opened up the program. We've been telling people on the air for the last several weeks. Of course, I've filled my freezer for winter. All I need now is a power outage. <laughs> but I have filled it with chicken and uh, various meats and some sausages. And a lot of people are doing that as we prepare for these colder months. You might want to drop by High Desert Meat Processing in Twin Falls, where one animal is processed at a time. What you bring in is exactly what you're going to get back. Darren Van Horn, he's the owner of High Desert Meat Processing. He's been in the business over 30 years. You can visit High Desert Meat Processing on Facebook, read reviews of other customers, or give High Desert Meat Processing a telephone call for all of your wild game and domestic processing needs. The number is 734-9949. High Desert Meat does in-house smoking and nothing gets shipped out. Now, getting back to our point about filling your refrigerator, kielbasa, breakfast sausage, brats, Polish dogs, hot dogs, turkey, pepperoni, salami, summer sausage. These are all things uh, that he can come up with at High Desert Meat Processing. USDA approved, and Darren works closely with local beef growers and their programs to ensure quality meat. The telephone number is 734-9949. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310. KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. Still some fallout coming in from across the country after Election Day. Now, we didn't really have too many earth-shattering things going on in Idaho, mainly just the municipal elections, but they have a new governor who's despised by the American left in Kentucky. Isn't that wonderful? And he supports Kim Davis, the county clerk from Rowan County, Kentucky, 
who said that she wasn't going to perform same-sex marriages. That has really annoyed the lefties out there because we have a $20 trillion deficit in this country. Well, officially, it's perhaps five, six, seven, eight times that. No one really knows how much money this country owes. But they would prefer to focus on all of these social issues. They keep telling us the culture wars are over, but they're the people who keep waging them. This comes out of Houston, Texas, where, as many of you know, the bathroom bill failed the other day. Uh, The city council had approved it, and then the pastors in the community got 55,000 signatures on a petition to drive it to a ballot. Then the mayor tried to confiscate the, the sermons that the pastors were giving. She wanted them submitted in advance. She lost a court case, and the judge said, nope, this is going to go to a public referendum, and the public slapped it down by a margin in excess of 20 points. Well, this is, this is one of the reasons is that that happened. The, the preachers in Houston, they were very clever. They put together a video, and it showed a toilet, because calling it the bathroom bill. In other words, guys who claim they are girls, they can actually go inside and, hey, honey, how you doing? And people don't want that. They don't want some pervert around their daughter. Even if he claims he's got some other issue, this could be used as, as, as a screen, a cover for all of that. And in fact, it has happened in Toronto, Ontario. The university there has suspended the same-sex uh, bathrooms. Uh, you know, In other words, uh, when Johnny says his name is actually Jenny and wants to go in and look up uh, you know, Jill's skirt, not going to happen. Uh, they said that they've got to put an end to it. So these, these pastors put together this, this production, and it shows money as well being thrown into a, into a toilet. And if you get a moment, take a listen to it. You won't be able to see the pretty pictures, but uh, the video itself, even the wording of it is quite funny. If Proposition 1 passes, you could be fined up to $5,000 for declining to participate in a same-sex wedding or simply objecting to a... Objecting to a... Object... <clears throat> objecting to a man using a woman's bathroom. $5,000 down the tubes. Remember last year, the mayor illegally disenfranchised voters and demanded Houston pastors turn over their sermons and private communications to government lawyers. The struggle is not over. Stand up, not only for the freedom to believe, but to live out your beliefs. Don't allow the government to flush your money or religious liberties. Vote now and vote no on Proposition 1. No person should be punished by the government because of their beliefs. Faith Family Freedom Fund is responsible for the content of this political advertising. So that aired on television and on YouTube in the Houston area, and it really was a game changer for the people who were trying to keep some traditional values. Liberals are very upset. They keep saying, yes, but you've got to understand, uh, they were calling it the bathroom bill, and it's actually a bathroom, it was a bill about equal rights. And then if you were to say to them, yes, but was, was the bathroom issue included, they would go, well, yeah, of course it was. But it was only one element. Well, it was still in there then, wasn't it? Yeah, but, however, although, well, we got your point. 828, Bill Colley on Top Story. We have a caller with us joining us on the air, and you're up next on News Radio 1310, KLIX. Yes, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty right about this, that Mr. Bevan, who's the new governor of Kentucky, ran against Mitch McConnell and was told he didn't have a chance in hell, and then they said he was going to lose this one. And uh, he, it, this guy is a sharp tack, man, and uh, he is informed and uh, proactive and fearless. And so the fact that this guy has been elected as governor when a couple of years ago nobody knew who the hell he even was yeah. <laughs> shows, shows what the deal is. And Mitch McConnell, he, he's done. The next election, he will not get reelected. He may end up resigning like Mr. Reed down there in Nevada. Yeah, I, I, I certainly hope so. And Mr. Reed, we're, if we get, thanks for the call. If we get a chance, Mr. Reed did something very naughty in the Senate. Uh, once again, we'll have to discuss that if we get a chance a little later in the show. Um, it, it just it just shows you how blatantly un-American that SOB happens to be. I don't know any other way to describe him. 829, we've got a break coming up in just a moment. But if I could share with you this as well, this is from the Daily Signal. Challenger unseats school board member who supported transgender policy. A school board member in Northern Virginia who supported a new policy on transgender students lost re-election Tuesday at the polls. 
The Fairfax County School Board, I went to a wedding there a couple of years ago, beautiful part of the country, voted earlier this year to include gender identity in its non-discrimination policy. Jeanette Howe defeated incumbent board member Ted Velkoff, who backed the policy. Velkoff has been on the board for three years. Parents don't want guys going into the girls' shower or the bathroom. You got it? Comprende? In an interview with the Daily Signal, Traditional Values Coalition parent uh, Andrea Lafferty said, the school board has been deceitful, dishonest, and arrogant. We've got more coming up on KLIX in just a moment.